Um, man, this is such an important story uh, for all of us to really get the nitty gritty of. So I'm going to pray one more time to ask the Lord to kind of open our hearts and minds because we may or may not talk about some uh, contentious issues this morning. Let's pray. Father, we, we lay before you, uh, not certainly not because we, uh, we feign ownership, but we lay before you this time, our hearts, our minds filled with different thoughts and values and priorities filled with different distractions and hurts, harms, traumas. And we want to just come before you, Lord, laying all of ourselves before you so that in this time you would use your word primarily here in Luke chapter 21 to speak a truth that we would not only hear, but carry with us into all that we do into all the places that we enter into amongst all the people we get to engage with to do great work, Lord, to the glory of your name. So father, would you be uh, kind to us and gracious unto us, Lord, as you use me to just deliver what you have prepared for us this morning in Jesus name. Amen. This little video, it comes from this very short story in Luke chapter 21. And it reads like this. Jesus looked up. Jesus looked up. He was doing something and then he stopped doing the thing he was doing. He looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. Notice how he writes that. Two small copper coins. And he said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than most, some, all, more than all of them combined. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all all she had to live on. I want to focus on this little phrase right here, looked up and saw, because it's a really unique way to describe what Jesus is doing. Luke kind of puts a more, because he's a doctor, more clinical twist on this phrase, but I, I actually prefer the way Mark writes it. Mark's account is almost identical. In fact, Mark's gospel is what, historically the first written gospel. And so Matthew and Luke, they appropriate Mark's gospel to write their own, which is why they sound so similar. And the way Mark describes that phrase, that, that Jesus looked up phrase, is like this. And Jesus sat down opposite the treasury. And Mark uses a very interesting word in the original language that's translated as he sat down opposite. He uses this word in the Greek, kadonanti, and it means literally to sit as a judge in opposition and in against someone that's about to be indicted, someone that's on trial for something. So not only is Jesus stopping to look up and observe, he's stopping to really execute judgment upon something that he's witnessing here with this widow and these people giving their offerings in the temple. And it's after this, <coughs> excuse me, it's after this little phrase, this little story, this little interaction of a widow pouring in two little mites into this offering box, <coughs> excuse me, that Jesus goes into the rest of Luke chapter 21, which is devoted to the end of time. For the next several passages, Jesus is going to talk about the destruction, not only of Jerusalem, but of the world. So just a little bit here. As you're still speaking about the temple, how it was adorned, right? And it was amazing. He says, as for these things that you see, the day will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Later on, he says, the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be afraid, for these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. Excuse me. He goes on to talk about the end of nations and powers 
of society, essentially, as we understand it, understand it. And so he starts to warn people saying, settle your accounts before the end of time, before I come and judge the living and the dead. And no one is immune from my judgment. He says, you will be delivered up even by parents and brothers. People will betray each other at the end and you will have to endure like you've never endured before. And when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. This is crazy language, right? This is scary fright. This is end of days language. And he goes on continually. For there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among the nations in Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and, in the, and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and waves. Scary language of the, the earth is chaotically rebelling against the sin of humanity people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken the powers of the heavens will be shaken then they will see the son of man coming in the cloud with power and great glory and when these things begin to take place straighten up raise your heads because the redemption is drawing near. The end is near. This is crazy end of days language, all instigated by this poor little widow. In other words, what Jesus saw with this widow was so extreme, and he hated what he saw so much. He went on this massive sermon slash lecture slash prophecy about the end of the world. Just because of this, this one little lady, two little pennies, it threw him into this. It triggered his end of times posture. So there's something happening here, clearly. That's not only important, probably it's, it's so important it pertains to the end of the world. What is it? What is happening here? Well, Let's just let's look at this story into three headings. First, let's look at the wickedness of what was witnessed. And let's contrast that with the goodness of what was promised. And then we'll end with some applications. We talk about the purpose in between. Why is Jesus, as he looks upon this poor little widow, why is he triggered to think about and talk about the end of the world? Number one, let's talk about the wickedness of what he's witnessed. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And when he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins, and, then, and he, then he saw in contrast, verse 2, right? One and two is a contrast. A poor widow put in two small copper coins. The way Luke and Mark write that is very intentional. It doesn't say the widow put in very little, although you could say that. Or the widow put in whatever her day's wages or whatever that accumulated to. He he literally wants the auth, the reader to to like calculate how much she's putting in. Two very small copper coins and to break that down. That's how little she's putting in there. That the writer wants to emphatically want, you know, invite you into calculating how little. But not only that. Uh, the video did a great job, if you notice, towards the beginning of illustrating what it looked like in the temple for people to do that. So M is sort of your main entrance. If you were a Jewish man, you would come in or a Gentile or a woman. You would actually not a Gentile. You had to be Jewish. Uh, Jewish men, man, you could come in through letter M, the gate M. And then K is sort of your central area of the first portion of the, of the temple. Back here, over here to your right, uh, C and A, those are the most holiest of holies where the Ark of the Covenant would have been placed and not many were allowed back there. And, and D and F and G and H, these are all parts that you know we've read about in the Old Testament candles and such and incense and altars. But if you were a first century woman, you couldn't go in through M. You were allowed in K, definitely not allowed in D, E and J, this right area. But you were not even allowed into K by means of M. You had to go in through a very small side entrance called the Gate of Women. 
And as you entered in, there would be these different offering boxes with, like you saw, a trumpet at the top of the box. And you would put in different amounts of money in different boxes for different kind of funding. And there was a general offering fund that most people would come and, and pour their offering. And you saw in that video what was common in that day, because everybody was allowed in this first part of the sanctuary of the temple. What was pretty common was if you wanted to socially show people that you're more holy, oh, you're a really charitable person, you would walk up to the main giving box and you would slowly pour, not carefully, silently put in, but pour out your offering. So the jingling and jangling of all your quarters and coins or whatever would trickle down the trumpet and make all this noise. In fact, commentators say that this, based on the architecture of the synagogue, that that jingling would have resounded. It would have echoed through the halls. And so maybe you're sitting there and you, you hear jingling and jangling, and then suddenly someone walks in through M gate, right? And he's wearing fancy robes and he pulls out this really heavy coin bag and he struts up to one of these trumpets and boxes and he starts pouring out and everyone can hear, oh, that's a, that's a charitable giver. That must be a godly man based on how much he's giving. And in contrast, you have this poor widow who comes in through the side gate who puts in such small quantities that you could barely hear the two coins fall into the box. Mark and Luke, they tell us that the two little increments that were given, like historically, these things, we, we the closest we can get to is a cent, but this is not even a cent. That's why it says what she puts in there are two fractions of a penny. Do you know what that means? Just think about it economically. What that means is this woman was so poor. They kind of, in a sense, created a new value of money just so that she could give something. What can you get for two fractions of a cent? Like real life, real terms. What can you get for half of a penny? Nothing. Nothing. Why does that fraction of money even exist? That's how poor she is. They had to create a new like value of a monetary thing because she is that poor. She couldn't even afford one actual penny. She could only afford two fractions of a penny. And notice that she doesn't give one of those. She gives two. So not only is she giving the least amount of money anyone could give, there's like this weird question of why are you giving these to begin with? Why don't you keep one? If you're this poor, why are you giving two? Just keep one for yourself. You're so poor. It's not going to make a difference. But she gives two because that's all she has. She doesn't want to hold back. She gives everything. And this is what triggers Jesus. Number one, that this woman is barred from entering into the main gate. Number two, that this woman, this widow, is forced to give fractions of a penny. Because all throughout the Old Testament, God has made crystal clear how to treat people like this woman. In Exodus and Isaiah, God says, you shall not mistreat any widow or follow this child. Pretty clear. Isaiah 117, learn to do good, seek justice, correct opposition, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. In Deuteronomy, God makes this uh, law for farmers, don't double reap everything in your land. You have to save some for the widow, for the fatherless, for the orphan. In Deuteronomy 15, something similar and says, likewise, you, you, if you have a widow or a foreigner coming into your land, you have to be hospitable. You have to take care of them. If you have orphans in your land, you have to take care of them. This is God's decree. This is his like constitution. And he says things like, don't pervert justice. Don't, don't the, the way I know you as a society, Israel practices injustice is if you neglect the widow and the orphan and the fatherless, right? but particularly if you neglect the widow. In other words, why is Jesus so angry 
at what he's seeing with his widow and the, her two little fractions of opinion. Why is she so angry? Because this widow should not exist. Why does she exist? God was crystal clear in the Old Testament. Widows like this shouldn't exist. You're supposed to take care of them. You're supposed to give them food. You're supposed to help them buy property. You're, you're supposed to protect them. And here you have an old widow who's so poor she can't afford a penny. And Jesus is like, what? what is this? Why does this exist? Or in other words, the woman represents, okay, listen in, the systemic and institutional disobedience of God's word, the disregard of God's character, and the disgrace of God's own grace to Israel. Some of the, what I'm going to go into here now, some of you have heard before because I've taught it before. Some of you are younger, so we need to do this new for you or maybe a refresh. Okay. But let, let me just explain what this sentence means. Again, imagine there's a community of giraffe that builds giraffe houses. And one giraffe invites an elephant over to his or her giraffe house. Now, a house for a giraffe, I would imagine, very tall and skinny, very narrow. No need for wide doors because giraffes are pretty skinny and tall. But an elephant is small, short, stout, and wide. And so the moment an elephant comes into the giraffe's house, he's breaking through the door. He's knocking things over on shelves, right? And over the course of time, the longer the elephant spends in the giraffe's house, let alone in a giraffe neighborhood, my assumption is going to be because the, the elephant kind of is just disrupting the way of life for the giraffe, there's going to be a couple of levels, maybe of bitterness, animosity. Maybe I'm going to use the word racism. So maybe at the early stages, there's what we call internalized racism. The giraffes have just these bitter feelings like, oh, you elephants are so fat and big. And why can't you be like us giraffes, skinny and tall and slender? Ugh, you guys are always breaking things, aren't you? Now, at a certain point, if the elephant keeps on spending time, let's say the elephant can't find a job anywhere else and finds a job in the giraffe neighborhood, my assumption is that those who have these internalized racist feelings against the elephant will maybe even practice and actually act upon those internalized feelings. And so we have something called interpersonal racism, which is the manifestation of internalized racism. This is when actually you get acts of bigotry, anti-Asian hate, which I don't know why that word exists, why it's racism. It's just ra whatever. So you have actual racist acts being performed in society. And when enough people, enough giraffes practice interpersonal racism and harbor internalized racism, you eventually get what we call institutional racism. And that's when you have these policies being created by giraffe leaders Man, these elephants, they keep on breaking our stuff. You know what we should do? When it comes to drinking fountains, swimming pools, schools, and restaurants, let's separate the giraffe and the elephant. You elephants, you can have a drinking fountain and a swimming pool. Just don't use our drinking fountain and our swimming pool. You understand? That's institutional. Or you go to school. And the school board, which is made mostly of giraffes, they say, you know, we really love how our giraffe community looks. Let's teach our, our younger giraffe students about how good it is to be a giraffe. And then an elephant student comes in and he, she starts learning about giraffes and has no understanding about what it means to be an elephant. Over the course of time, you know what's going to happen when you get enough institutions acting racist against elephants? You get what we call Systemic racism. Systemic racism is unconscious social expectations and standards of what it means to be normal and acceptable in society. So, for instance, I don't know if you've ever experienced this here in Bellevue, slash East Side, Washington, but I experienced growing up. For instance, if I would bring my mom's cooking to school, all my white friends would be like, what does it smell? Or when you eat dumplings in public, for some reason, people always ask for chopsticks instead of a fork. Or uh, a systemic attribute of racism would be, man, those people always listen to their music so loud, don't they? That's systemic racism. Where did that come from? It, we use the word stereotype, but it's actually an expectation, right? 
So if you see a car full of certain type of people listening to certain type of music at a certain volume, don't you have assumptions? That's what we call systemic racism. And as a side note, when I say unconscious, the reason nowadays we have this word uh, that has been totally just perverted. Nowadays, we have this word. Next slide. Oh, can you go back? This word woke. Do you guys know where the etymology of this word came from? This was a this was captained by the black community a long, long time ago because the black community first understood about the unconscious biases ingrained into the system of society when someone would start to realize, oh, that I didn't see that before. That's why they say they're woke. But nowadays we have something called wokeism, meaning I I'm going to believe in whatever you say is woke simply for the sake of fitting in, which is ironic because that's exactly what woke is trying to push against. It's trying to push against this notion of systemic issues, institutionalized issues. And so our modern solution, okay, this is probably review from Rossi. Our modern solution to these systemic injustices is to destroy the system. And that's what we call critical race theory, right? Critical race theory founded by Marx and a little bit of Manuel Kant means some systems are created, like that giraffe system. How do you create, how do you make, how do you turn the giraffe village into a, a village that's more fitting for elephants? You can't. So you have to destroy the giraffe village and you have to start all over. That's critical race theory. And in a sense, that makes sense, doesn't it? In some ways, that makes sense that you, we just have to start over. If something started off wrong, the only way to fix it is to destroy it and start over again. And that's, that's why Marxism pretty much says any power system needs to be destroyed. And here's the thing. In a very similar way, not exact, Jesus says he's going to do the same thing. He sees this poor widow who society has completely systemically disenfranchised. They marginalized her. They don't care about her. Anymore. And in fact, even in the temple, the temple was now this system and institution that celebrated the affluent, the rich. And as for the poor, they just stayed poor. Don't mess up our rich system. You guys just stay poor. And Jesus hated that. So what did he do? What did he promise? He promised that he's going to destroy it. But not exactly. Because the way that Jesus is going to destroy it is even better. And at least to point to, we're almost done here. He says, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty and all that she had to live on. How does Jesus know that the widow gave more than all of them? What gives him the right to say that? Because dollar-wise, obviously that's not true. What, what is it about Jesus that makes him able to say she gave more than everyone else? He's talking as if he alone understands value and he alone understands power. And later on in the text, he says that. As, the prophecy, as he continues to prophesy at the end of the world, he says, for the powers of the heavens, even the heavens will be shaken. By whose power? Verse 27, the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great joy. And I'm sorry, great glory. Jesus is coming to usurp and, and destroy the systemic oppressive powers on earth. Absolutely. But he's going to do it in a better way because instead of destroying it for the sake of destroying it, like Marx would say, He's going to destroy it to recreate it, to replace it with something better, with redemption. And that's why the woman did what she did. Why did this poor woman, fiscally irresponsible in some ways, why did she give all that she had? Because she didn't trust the power of the system. She knew there was a power bigger than the system and better than the system. She trusted in the power of God. And it was her wisdom to see above and beyond the systemic oppression there to see the universal cosmic power out there in God. My clicker is so slow today. So the difference of 
the power of the earth and power of the system and power of Christ, okay, as a summary, is that the power of any kind of um, any kind of destruction of power and replacement of power on our terms is always going to contradict itself. That's that's the reason why Christians, in many ways, should be anti-critical race theory or critical theory in general, because the the idea says the only way to fix a power problem is to replace it with new power. I don't know if you, you ever seen this movie. It's based on a true story about uh, a conflict in Africa between two tribes, the Hutu and the Tutsis. These are both marginalized communities. When the, If they were to immigrate to America, they'd be in completely impoverished, both tribes. And yet here, in this local context in Africa at the time, they essentially genocided each other, even though they're both from marginalized groups. Any time, in other words, you have people replacing the powers of people, you will still have people in power, and that's the problem. But the power of the gospel, next slide, is that, again, Jesus does not use his power simply to destroy but to redeem. And where do you see that? You see that on the cross. On the cross, Jesus is destroyed. Why? He's the most cosmic power. He has ultimate power. Why is that power of his destroyed so that someone else can come into power? No, to empower others, to empower you and me by the Holy Spirit to experience life as he designed it and intended it. And that's why at the very end of his prophecy, he says, man, what's coming is not Destruction is near, but he says redemption is near. Application, real quick. Jesus praises the woman not over how much she gives, but how she gives, the fact that she gives. And how did she give? The woman did not focus on how much God demands, but again, on how much she can give. She trusted in the power of God so much that she was just wanting to give as much to God and submit to that power at all costs. Now, what does that mean for you and for me? That means three things. Number one, how do you give like the widow gave in this story? Number one is time. I see time in, in kind of three ways you can offer time. Time is if I offer God time, it could be sometimes inward. I read the Bible and I really think and I pray and I'm working on my heart. Giving time to the Lord is outward. Literally going and volunteering, coming to church, asking someone how their how their week is, um, meeting with someone, you know, checking in on someone. That's outward time being spent. And then there's upward time, just time being spent worshiping, right? Um, giving thanks to God, kind of praising God for His attributes. Number one is time, and so. When we have offering time, for instance, how can you give if you feel like I have no money to give, but you can give time? And so you could put into that box a commitment. This week, I'm going to read X amount of chapters. This week, I'm going to call two people and check in on them. This week, I'm going to praise God every morning for at least one minute. Time. The second way you can give are your talents. Every single one of you is talented in different ways. And, and for those who feel like as that offering box passes and you're like, I have no money to give in there, what you can give, not only your time, you can give your talent. First of all, we need talent up here. We need talent to help this congregation enter into worship and to learn how to worship more authentically or more safely. We need your talents to help make this thing, this ministry, this church more effective, more impactful, more inviting and welcoming. Some of you are really gifted at making people feel welcome. I will love for you to use that talent to help this space become more welcoming. Some of you are talented at art, graphic design. Awesome. I need your help. Let's, let's build something that other people can find attractive and sticky and memorable so they want to come. Some of you are, are incredibly talented at being detail-oriented. That's awesome. I am not detail-oriented, and I need your help. Some of you are experts and have a heap of knowledge to teach us on something. I need your help to teach, even if you're middle school, high school. Why can't you be up here teaching us? And, of course, lastly, 
The third way to give as the widow gave is your tithes. Now, we immediately think of money, and some of you, you don't have money. But you know what you do have? You have a dream, an ambition, a goal, and a purpose to make money. You have a college and a major that you intend to pursue to make money. And so as that box passes, you may have nothing in your wallet, but you got something in your heart. And so I wonder if the spirit leads you to do so, would you offer, you know, you got these dreams and ambitions. Would you offer those dreams and ambitions to the Lord to give all you have as the widow did because Christ has given it all unto you. And, in, and lastly, to give the tithe of advocacy. Advocacy is a bringing, onto, bringing awareness onto what God cares deeply for. To bring awareness to sex trafficking, to the needs of foster families, to bring awareness to the destruction of pornography, to bring awareness to issues of poverty in our city, to bring awareness to what does it mean to be Christian and struggle with same-sex attraction. Bring awareness, advocacy. That could be, that's also in many ways your tithe because you're getting people to like do something about it, right? And sometimes give. All that to say, as we close, what did Jesus see in the widows that made him so angry? He saw a systemic injustice and oppression of power. So one day he's going to come, he's going to destroy that power. Absolutely. But he's not just going to destroy it for the sake of instituting another power. He's going to do so by means of redeeming correcting, healing. He's going to do so not by destroying the people, but by eliminating the, the structures and the protocols and the, and the power imbalances while saving the people. And so in response, what can we do? May we give as the widow gave our time, talents, our times. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you so much, Lord. I, I, I thank you, Lord, that you are a God who and I don't know who needs to hear this, but Lord, I pray that you would you would preach this to somebody. The destruction of God is not bad. When God destroys something, it's not bad. It's actually really good. When God threatens to destroy something, it's not bad. It's really, really good. Because the way and the reason you destroy things is not like the way we destroy things. You destroy things to redeem and fix and heal things. And so I pray, I pray a bold prayer for some of us. God, would you help us to ask for your destruction in some areas of our life? Because we know that there are areas in our life that need to be destroyed in a redemptive way. So would you do that? For some of us, particularly when it comes to giving, whether it's our time, our talents, and our tithes, for those of us who are just so un unwilling to give, who are constantly obsessed with gaining, would you destroy that selfishness in us, Lord? For some of us, destroy that unwillingness to give of our time, talents, and times. And teach us and show us how good it was to be like that widow who gave all to a God who has given all. Father, I pray, would you um, encourage us, Lord, to be anti-oppression, to be aware continually of uh, systemic injustices and not to participate in the critical race theories manifestation of justice, but the Bible and the gospel's way of bringing about holistic justice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we have yet another goodbye today. Last week, we say goodbye to Chris. This week, we say goodbye to Joseph. Uh, Joseph, can you do me a favor? Can you come up here real quick? Joseph is, you're moving to college, man. You're going to California this uh, Tuesday? Yeah, okay. Can you sit here? And uh, Josh, if you want to take his right side. And if you guys, uh, Jill, if you want to come up too, you, you can, uh, you mind if we touch you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't touch me. Uh, would you guys just extend your hand? Let's let's pray over Joseph. Um I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to pray on your own. Would you pray for him? And then uh, and then I'll ask uh, Josh to pray, and then I'll close in prayer.
Father God, we come before you and give first and foremost uh, thanks for Joseph. Uh, I personally am just, uh, I, I, I'm personally brightened every Sunday morning when I see him smiling um, and just saying hello to me. And Lord, as he goes down to Cali and off to this next season of life, this new adventure, would you, would you continually be with him on his journey? Uh, whether it's, you know, just as simple as eating dinner or as complex as navigating what life in college is like these days. Lord, would you keep him and protect him as he's there and, and uh, allow him to be a blessing on the community and the spaces which he will in inhabit? Lord, would you guard the hearts of his family as they see him off and you know, only occasionally see him from time to time, but to know that Joseph, uh, who is going to college, is learning these skills and learning these things for the betterment of God's kingdom in the future. Lord, we give you thanks for Brother Joseph once more. We pray this prayer in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Father God, we praise you so much for um for Joseph. We lift up our brother to you. Uh, we know that you will watch over him, that you will be with him in the moments where he may feel alone in the beginning in a new area. Um and and just in uh, maybe what I would call a struggle to learn about who he is, um, his identity in Christ, Father. Um and uh, I just pray, God, that you um, just give him comfort and give him security that he is a child of God. Father, we thank you uh, for the many ways he has blessed Zoe, the many ways that he has served humbly, faithfully, consistently, just um, being present here. Father, we will miss him, um, but we know that you have bigger and greater things waiting for him there in California. Um so, Father, we, th this may be a goodbye uh, for us, but, Father, we know that um, you have prepared a, a, a new community for him to immerse himself in, um, to serve and continually grow in his faith uh, in you. So, Father, we um, pray over this time. What a, what a beautiful journey that he has ahead of him. Um, God, we, we thank you so much uh, for the times that we were able to just worship together um, with him alongside of him um so father we we just pray that you uh, just lead him guide him as he uh goes on this next season of, of his life in jesus name and father <clears throat> thank you so much lord for joseph lord in our lives yeah, i just want to reiterate that prayer that lord that he would never forget um his identity in you that Jesus, you love him so much. Uh, you are with him. And though valleys may come and seasons may feel dry, Lord, you are faithful. You are faithful. Thank you for Joseph, Lord. May you be his desire, his passion, his next steps, his thoughts, his every breath. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. That's it for now. Uh, I'm just going to hang out.